theme that we will hear uh, throughout this conference, but we have uh, three presenters today. We have uh, Joe Courtright, who's with us here. Uh, we have Ben Holland as well from the Rocky Mountain Institute. And then uh, Jared Johnson is joining us virtually uh, for today's presentation. So I'm uh, going to keep things brief because I have been conscripted, and uh, I'm just going to turn it over to Joe to uh, run with this here. Thanks, Ben. And thanks so much for stepping in at the last minute and performing this critical moderator role. Um, I'm <laughs> Joe Courtright. I'm with City Observatory. I'm an economist. We're based here in Portland, Oregon. And I have, you know, th the bane of everyone's existence, of course, is having an economist talk after lunch with PowerPoint slides. So you get the trifecta here. Um, assuming that the technology uh, will cooperate, and I'll just vamp until we get, until we get the PDF presentation going. So for those of you who don't know, I'll just introduce City Observatory. We're a, a, a think, think tank, policy tank here in Portland. We're based, on, we're focused on urban policy issues, including transportation, housing, economic development, and equity. Uh, and we do uh, both our own original research, uh, daily commentary on a range of urban policy affairs, and then um, also um, daily and weekly commentary on, on urban policy. So. Um, with that, I'll launch into, I hope, my presentation. Am I getting help? I'm getting a high sign from the folks out there over there. Um, I'll just pause for a second. This is why we probably need a moderator at this point, somebody to step in. Okay. Yeah, this is ben, Ben's very good at that, I'm sure. Um, so basically, the gist of what I want to talk about today is the, the interlocking way as you heard at the, l at the uh, lunch panel today, that transportation, housing, and land use are really, I think as Alex Baca put it, different sides of the same coin. And that's true on a whole series of levels. It's true on a, on a, on a parent living level today as we see um, the world in front of us, but it's also deeply embedded in the history and the institutional character of places. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about today really from an economic perspective. The way in which transportation in particular uh, is determinative of many of the aspects of housing markets and therefore a whole lot of things that are attached to housing as well. Um, and I'm still vamping here waiting for the presentation. We could all crowd around my laptop if that would, that would work better. I'm sure this makes for a scintillating uh, view for folks who are watching uh, from elsewhere. Um, so let me just say one other thing in the way of context too, which is when we're talking about cities and urban policy, and what particularly attracts me to, to come to Yimby Town is I think in the United States, we have not simply uh, an affordable housing problem and a shortage of housing. Ultimately, what we have is a shortage of cities. Uh, there's a growing demand for urban living in the United States for all of the characteristics uh, of ur uh, and amenities of urban places. And when cities work well, uh, we know that they're great sources of, of wealth and opportunity uh, and really ways that people can, can realize their dreams. Um, and in the United States, um, we've, we have much more demand for great urban spaces than we have available urban spaces. And there are really two ways that we can tackle that problem. Uh, one is to build more housing in the greater urban places that we already have, and the other is to improve the urban amenities in all the other places where we actually do have housing. Um, and obviously, one of the linking ingredients there is transportation and transportation policy. And so that's what I'll wanna uh, talk about. Assuming I get some, some slides. Yeah, question, shoot. Yeah, actually we have, uh, we have uh, Ben on climate policy as well. As, although what you'll see, and this will be the handoff to Ben, is talking about some of the climate implications of the way our housing and land use systems seem to be working. Aaron, do you have any advice on what we ought to be doing now? Oh, pardon? Uh, 
I do. Can we, do we have our Zoom call available? We have one. Okay, hold on just a second. I think we're discovering that the one thing that's worse than an economist with a slideshow is an economist <laughs> without a slideshow. And I apologize for that. So, hey. Hello. Now we'll put that to the test. Um, so, again, what I wanted to do is talk about the, the uh, connection between transportation and land use policy. Go on to the next slide. Um, that was a lot to ask. I start with a simple premise. Um, and again, this is something that's true on a lot of levels. Um, cars and the impacts that they've had on the urban environment have been profound. And as I just mentioned, there's this issue with, uh, that I would describe as the shortage of cities. One of the reasons for the shortage of cities and the damage to the, to the fabric of urban environment and urban places uh, and the problems that we have, frankly, with housing are related to cars. And let me be much more specific about this. Next slide. Um, we know from ruin porn that we've seen that it's literally the case that freeways um, cut through neighborhoods, like the Claiborne Expressway in New Orleans. And we can point to these in every city in the United States, where literally it was the construction of, uh, uh, of roadways, the rededication of space from a variety of uses, particularly housing, but a whole range of civic places, um, to um, highway use. Um, and we're actually sitting just, I think, off camera to the left. This is downtown Portland circa 1964, and you can see that we basically obliterated um, the neighborhood that we're in right now, uh, in part uh, for er in the name of urban renewal, but also to build a large freeway that would have been at the southern edge of, of this screen. Um, and that's a story that I think is well known. That's not surprising. but. It isn't just the construction of freeways and the destruction of the uses that were there before that are the reason that cars kill cities, because building the highways is just the first step. After that happens, then we have a flood of automobile traffic. Next slide. Okay, and this is the construction of what's called the Minnesota Freeway in Portland, which uh, bisected the Albina neighborhood, which is just north of Portland, and which is being proposed to be widened at a cost of about one and a half billion dollars by the Oregon Department of Transportation. And you can see that this literally obliterated um, hundreds of housing units and displaced thousands of families. Next slide, please. But that was just the start, because after that freeway and other freeways were constructed, the neighborhoods uh, that were bisected by those neighborhoods or by those freeways lost population. The Albina neighborhood in Portland collectively fell from about 14,000 people in 1950 to about 4,000 people in 1970. And the construction of the freeways basically happened in the first half of that period. There was continuing decline of population because those neighborhoods were no longer viable with lots of people pushed out by, uh, by highway construction. Um, new activity came in that was overwhelmingly car dominated and what had been a viable neighborhood with a lot of local, local businesses was transformed into automobile oriented retail, parking lots, gas stations, car dealerships and the like. And that triggered the further decline of that neighborhood. So it's not just building highways that causes cities to decline, it's the influx of automobiles and the rededication of space to moving automobiles. Next slide. And this is true nationally. There's a great study out of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia by uh, Brinkman and Lynn that basically and, uh, um, shows that the closer you are to an urban freeway, um, the more likely it is your neighborhood's population is to decline. And what they did is essentially take for the 50 or so largest metropolitan areas and divided them up into four uh, sets of neighborhoods. Neighborhoods that were um, up to two and a half miles from the center of the region, neighborhoods that were two and a half to five miles, five to 10 miles, or more than 15 miles uh, away. And essentially what that shows you, what those lines show you, is what happened to population in the years after, the, or in, 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 in a, over a period of years, based on how far those neighborhoods were from the nearest freeway. 
And in urban areas, you had huge declines in population if you were very close to a freeway. That was true also in more outlying urban neighborhoods. But then when you go to suburban neighborhoods, they actually grew faster in the, pla in the places that were closer to freeways. So for cities, the effect of building highways is to cause a loss of population, particularly in urban neighborhoods. So that's a way in which cars uh, uh, kill cities. Next slide. Now I want to give you a little parable um, because I appreciate that's highly quantitative. And I want to give you something to take away and think about the really um, nuanced and uh, integral way in which the automobile domination fundamentally reweaves the fabric of urban spaces. And I want to talk about corner stores because we know, you know, if you're an urbanist, we all talk about, you know, the ideal urbanist community is one where people can easily walk to a nearby store to get a, a gallon of milk or a quart of milk, whatever they need. Um, and it's uh, really interesting. So one of the things we want to do is you know, change regulations to allow corner stores because we know zoning is separated uses and in many suburbs made it simply illegal to have corner stores. Um, but that's not the primary reason we don't have corner stores in the United States. Next slide. Um, they really are a talisman of, of the urbanist uh, discussion. This I picked up off of Twitter, I think, late last week, um, talking about how in Seattle, well, where they're trying to encourage stores, but they only allow stores in the uh, industrial zone. So they're not allowing them to build new stores next to, um, next to all of the um, residential development they're building. That's clearly a problem, but there's a deeper problem, as I'll go on. Next slide. Um, and the interesting thing is when you look back and in the urban fabric of any city in the United States, you'll see that we used to have corner stores virtually everywhere. And what I've done is gone back to 1930, 1935, and identify all of the grocery stores in Portland, Oregon, in the city of Portland. And I'll just give you a quick comparison to how that's, how that, what that looked like uh, eight decades ago and what it looks like now. Uh, in 1935, there were about 1,200 grocery stores in Portland, Oregon. Today, there are about 300. Our population has essentially doubled in that period of time. This is in the city limits of Portland. The number of stores per capita, each store served about 250 households. In 1935, it serves about 2,000 today. Um, about 95% of those grocery stores in 1935 were mom and pop enterprises, single establishments that were typically privately owned. Today, it's 80% or more are, are national chains and, uh, and other corporate ownerships. And the other thing that we've done is we've mapped the location of those grocery stores and we know how far the average Portland resident lived from a grocery store then. Uh, in 1935, more than half of the population lived within 250 meters of a grocery store, about three or four blocks maximum. Today, it's fewer than 20% of city residents and it's even worse in the suburbs. So what that tells you is in the advent of the automobile age, the economics of retailing changed in a profound way. Back in the 1930s, virtually everyone, whether they owned a car or not, lived within walking distance of a grocery store. Today it's the case that very few people live within walking distance of a grocery store, and we have far fewer options. And that clearly works systematically to the disadvantage of people who don't have incomes, don't have cars, and who live in communities where their neighbors have similar characteristics. Next slide, please. Um, and really what the car did was fundamentally change the economics of retailing. Back when most people didn't own cars, nobody would walk past their neighborhood grocery store to go to another grocery store. And in fact, you did not have supermarkets in the United States until really the late 1930s when the first ones came out. And their entire business model was predicated on people driving to the store and offering a larger store, somewhat discounted prices and a better selection. And very systematically, over the next four or five decades, those supermarkets wiped out the economics of mom and pop retail corner groceries. There were a lot of losers in that process, and the biggest losers were people who lived in neighborhoods that, uh, where they didn't have cars and where their stores were forced to go. The interesting thing was there weren't any food deserts in the United States in the 1930s because essentially most people walked to stores, so there were lots and lots of local stores. To the extent food deserts are a problem or even a thing, it has everything to do with automobiles and the transformation that they've meant to, to, the, um, to the retail economy. Um, the other thing that's interesting is, and I, this is what my segue to what uh, Ben's gonna talk about is, this transformation with the stores getting bigger and moving farther away from where people lived 
was that now we spend a lot more time, money, and carbon in grocery shopping. Roughly speaking, according to national statistics, about 5% of all car travel in the United States involves people shopping for groceries. Next slide, please. Um, oh, and just to show you, uh, this is the graphic image of, of where grocery stores were in Portland in 1935. Um, we're basically right here, um, and the rest of it you can see, the rest of it you can see is the city of Portland. That's what it looked like in 1935. This is what it looks like today. That was the next slide, Kilu. <laughs> you can see that it's a lot sparser. Maybe you can just bounce back and forth to give people the impression of how many stores disappeared and how convenient it was in 1935 and how inconvenient it is today. Um, and that change was really dictated not by the, any change in zoning or regulatory policies, it was dominated by the economics. Um, next slide, please. Um, and as, as I mentioned, grocery shopping trips equal about 120 billion vehicle miles of travel each year. That's about 4% of all the car travel in the U.S. And it results in producing about 60 million tons of greenhouse gases. And this is a number, a lot of people talk about food miles. These are the food miles in the United States. It's not the miles of moving stuff from the farm, which is actually relatively efficient. It's the, all the greenhouse gases that are created by the fact that we drive long distances to grocery stores. So just a couple of final points here. Uh, next slide. Um, so we clearly want walkable urbanization, and that means urban amenities within walking distance. And I pick grocery stores not because they're the only thing we care about, but they really are emblematic of the kind of activity that we want to have in our neighborhoods if we want to promote walking. Same thing would be true of, you know, of restaurants, of dry cleaners, of any sorts of stores or activity that we want to have. You know, we have to have a situation where not just the regulation allows it, but the economics of it make it possible. And that's the big challenge, because cars are so um, well subsidized and underpriced, it's really difficult for um, the economics of the small scale retailing to, to replace itself. So transportation policy and the way we approach transportation and the s vast subsidies that we have for automobiles really undermine the kind of urbanism that we would like to have in the United States. So I offer that really as a starting point and a cautionary tale. But to think about the way in which transportation and land use are related, not just at the way that, that roads destroy neighborhoods, but the way that car dominance fundamentally changes the economics of the way we live in ways that preclude us from having the kind of urbanization that we would like to have. So thanks. Joe, I think the first part of your presentation really drives home for me something that uh, I'll say again tomorrow. Shameless plug, since I'm now here, um, that uh, highway building is a housing crisis. Um, highway building is also a public health crisis. And I think on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Ben Holland with the Rocky Mountain Institute uh, to take it away. Okay, so I'm going to try to run through these really quickly because I know we took a fair amount of time in the beginning. We've got to let Jared speak as well. But I'll just go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Ben Holland. I'm with uh, RMI, formerly known as Rocky Mountain Institute. Um, I am a manager on our urban transformation team, which is kind of, for all intents and purposes, our carbon free cities and regions team. Um, I've been at RMI for for a few years now, for the past seven years. And um, if you know anything about the Institute, um, you know that we're fairly kind of um, tech, techno-optimistic climate organization. Um, I think we've even been called like techno-narcissists by, by your buddies in the CNU crowd. <laughs> but um, uh, what's that? Yeah, <laughs> it was, I did say that. I was just at the Congress for the New Urbanism with Ben um, a couple weeks ago. but. Um, it was actually just through, through CNU and um, 
you know, actually a lot, a lot of people in this room, including Jared Walker, they were a big influence on our team. Over the last few years, we started to embrace um, more than just kind of a technical approach to reducing uh, emissions, and in my case, transportation emissions, that being the electric car, the most kind of dominant tool in the climate space. Um, for decarbonizing transportation, we started to look at a more holistic scope of work. But, um, and that has, I'll go to the next slide. That has uh, materialized into a new team, uh, which we call the Climate Aligned Urbanism Team. You have three of us here right now. Zach Subin's right here in the front row. Anna Zet Kulik is somewhere here uh, today. And Julia Thane cannot be with us right now. She's, um, she's on vacation, I believe. But basically what this represents is a pretty big shift for the organization um, in that we are embracing uh, you know, non-electrification transportation solutions uh, to climate change. Um, so, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it, it took a few years to make it happen, but um, we're excited to move forward with this work. But um, I'll go to the next slide. I'm sorry, you have to scroll down. <laughs> but okay, one of the one of the big things that sort of big pieces of research that Zach um, largely led was uh, a report that we put out um, looking at scenarios in which the U.S. could keep uh, all of its sectors on path with a 1.5 degrees carbon budget, the, basically the IPCC's carbon budget, out to 2030. Um, we found for the transportation sector in the U.S., it would have to reduce transportation, or it would have to reduce, reduce emissions by 45 percent. And we asked ourselves, what, do, what is that equivalent to? And uh, basically, what we came down to is um, 70 million EVs by 2030. We have about 2 million right now, with less than eight years to go. And even under that wildly optimistic scenario, we would have to reduce vehicle miles traveled by 20 percent per capita to stay on path there. So we've started to align everything around that work. Um, starting with a handful of kind of VMT reduction strategies or vehicle miles traveled reduction strategies. Big one being smart growth, which we're kind of talking about today, um, which is sort of a catch-all term we're using. We can talk about it afterwards if that's the best one. Um, looking at pr pricing signals, transportation demand management uh, strategy, strategies, which, is, um, which includes transit, as well as street design. And um, a big thing that we're obviously talking about this week is ending highway expansions. But I'll go to the next one. So we started to look at um, the individual strategies. And again, this is just a, these are just a handful. There are obviously more that can achieve these reductions. But we wanted to put, start putting some real numbers behind um, what is possible with each of these interventions. Um, one of the things that we've noticed in the climate world is that there's been insufficient attention given to um, sort of non-electrification strategies, um, often because the policymakers the climate funders, uh, a lot of the advocates lack um, sufficient sort of data or um, evident, evidence to, to really support these interventions in a big way. So what you see is just uh, the, the classic situation where we're falling back on um, assuming some level of adoption of electric vehicles to achieve these goals going out to 2030 and 2050. Um, so we're going to talk about most part around um, smart growth and in particular kind of infill development and housing and how it relates to climate. I'll go to the next slide. So this is um, some analysis that Zach put together based on uh, cool climate data. Um, Chris Jones out of UC Berkeley. Basically what it finds is that, um, and feel free to correct me if I don't get this wrong, but basically finds that there's a tremendous amount of opportunity to, um, to, add, uh, to add a significant amount of housing in V, low VMT areas of the of the country, um, and at the same time allowing for more inclusive housing uh, and equity benefit as well, um, all while reducing emissions. So, anything you would add to that? Okay, all right. Let's go to the next slide. So, this is looking just at California, really, uh, starting with Mountain View and then California statewide. And California statewide is basically an average of all the. Um, cities and localities adopting a, a VMT reduction in infill development uh, policies. But what we found in looking at the data ac across California really is that oftentimes urban infill development rises to the top as one of the most critical or the most critical lever for reducing carbon emissions. Um, and then inst interestingly, uh, at times the EV falls uh, much further down uh, the line from that. So. Again, this is, a nut, this is something we're trying to elevate in a big way to our peers in the climate space, um, the funders and, and other uh, 
uh, policymakers. If we go to the next slide. So um, we're kind of breaking down our strategy into four different parts right now, um, looking at data analytics that pr basically prove the p case for reducing emissions through infill development and smart growth policies, working with cities to implement the policies that will further those, building local coalitions, as we know, are very important. And uh, this fourth piece is really around um, envisioning a design, um, kind of your classic kind of um, community engagement process of looking at what, uh, what future scenarios are, are um, most compelling um, and at the same time capable of reducing emissions. And I'll go down. I think this might be the last one. Oh, actually, this wasn't supposed to be in here. But this is a preview of a report that we're going to be putting out in the summer. Basically, it looks at, um, it argues for zoning reform as a climate or a carbon mitigation lever and focuses on three uh, very large, fast-growing cities, Charlotte, Austin, and Denver. And we found that for all three of the cities, there's a significant opportunity to reduce vehicle miles traveled um, if, if those cities were to apply an infill sort of smart growth land use um, priority over sort of the business as usual growth forecast. One, just on, in one case, Austin, we looked at um, forecast going out to 2040 for the whole region um, and essentially did an alternative scenario where we put more of the housing in transit rich low VMT areas of the city and found that within the city boundaries, you could see something more on the order of 20 to 25 percent reduction in VMT per capita versus business as usual. Region-wide, it was only 7 percent because the suburban development patterns are so egregious that it starts to wipe out the, um, the benefits of just the Austin-focused uh, land use reform. So um, we're going to start with this and then potentially look at, you know, some of the, the, the classic kind of CNU uh, principles such as uh, suburban retrofit going forward. But I think this is actually the final slide. So yeah, um, just coming up next, um, over the next few months to a year, I'm going to continue doing more analysis, looking at the advantages of land use reform. Uh, we'll be engaging states on IIJA funds. We have a product that we're developing right now called the Clean Transportation Portfolio, which will essentially ideally um, inform state DOTs and decision makers at the state level and how to best use the funds that they're getting through IIJA. The idea being that we're kind of a critical make or break moment where if, um, if you've seen some of the recent analysis from the Georgetown Climate Center, a business as usual, usual approach to investing in transportation is only going to increase emissions. So um, <clears throat> we're hoping to work with a number of partners, coalitions at the state level to get in front of those funds and help states make better decisions um, on that front. And uh, continuing to work with cities, and uh, this last piece I think I started off the presentation with, but um, we have found, again, that, you know, if we come to conferences like this, it makes a lot of sense to everybody, it's pretty intuitive to you, of the relationship between smart growth and um, lower carbon emissions. It has not really hit, um, like the way we would like, to, how we would like to, how, it has not resonated in the way we wanted to with the uh, larger climate community. I think there's, that's changing and there's reason to be optimistic, but there's still a lot of work to do as far as getting the big funders, the big policymakers, and a lot of the, the climate advocates on the, the ground on board with this work that we're all trying to do together. So I'll stop there. I know we need to get to Jared and uh, we'll get into questions as well. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. Um, I'm going to save questions till the end, just so we make sure that Jared has enough time uh, to go ahead. But uh, last but certainly not least, uh, we have Jared Walker, uh, the Executive Director uh, from Transit Matters. Jared Johnson. Jared Johnson I'm sorry. Uh, many Jareds. Jared Johnson, the Executive Director of Transit Matters out of Boston, who's joining us uh, virtually today. So we'll uh, get him on the screen uh, and uh, hear from him. Right. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, that's um, that was probably one of the most like honorable, um, um, you know, uh, mis misnamings. So, but anyway, uh, excited to be 
uh, with you all virtually. Sorry, I couldn't be there in person, but uh, excited to uh, to continue this talk. And you know, I think just just picking up um, just picking up on that on that last thread. Uh, um, yeah, there's definitely a lot more work uh, to be done to get um, to get folks in the climate sphere. Um, you know, to get them thinking about this. And I think the two sort of things that are that, you know, we've got to make sure they understand is, you know, what, what we all know, you know, that housing policy is climate policy that, you know, we can't, uh, we can't talk about, um, you know, we can't talk about how we're going to, you know, save the planet if we're still having development patterns uh, that push folks, um, you know, into open space uh, and still, you know, have poor land use patterns. And then um, I think uh, folks talked about this earlier that, you know, transit has to be a key, um, has to be a, you know, a key part of any, uh, any major uh, climate change strategy that we've really got to be talking about mode shift uh, that we've got to be talking about getting people out of cars uh, and not just into you know slightly greener cars um, that's that's a huge part so talking about what's going on in Massachusetts we've actually had some you know some some pretty big success um, for Massachusetts Massachusetts for as progressive as its um, as its reputation is can move rather slowly on some things but we had a major when um, um, late last year, when the uh, when the governor, uh, the legislature um, signed in a new a new law uh, that mandates multifamily zoning near um, near transit stations, and that's largely going to have an impact on our commuter rail, uh, since for the most part we are our our, um, our subway network runs. Uh, there's multifamily housing is is already um, multifamily zoning is already there, but it's going to require cities and towns to have. Um, you know, a district of about 50 acres um, where multifamily multifamily housing has to be uh, allowed by right, which I think is going to be, um, you know, huge. Um, and so that I think is the biggest, um, you know, that's been the biggest change um, for um, for our work here. And so um, it's it's been a really great opportunity. Obviously, it's been a really great opportunity for housing and transit folks uh, to start working closely together. You know, there have been some, you know, some work. Um, uh, particularly, you know, when from folks like uh, Mass Mark Growth Alliance um, and and from um, uh, one of our uh, great quasi state agency uh, called Mass Housing Partnership that had done some great work, just sort of showing uh, the, the the housing capacity of so many of these communities that surrounded commuter rail. Uh, but this has been the first time that we've really um, worked together, um, you know, much more closely because there's been there's an actual uh, piece of legislation that we're influencing, and so. We actually just wrapped up uh, the comment period for that because it's the, the law just created a framework, uh, and then it, it, um, the the state's housing and community development um, agency had to actually um, you know put those rules uh, into place. So we're really really excited about um, you know about you know the next step of this, which is once the law gets in place. Unfortunately, you know, and I think unlike uh, some of the provisions in California. Uh, the teeth maybe aren't as strong as we would like. So I think the first part is going to be just really encouraging and figuring out how we can um, do technical assistance, um, you know, support cities and towns in this. And some of the key things we're looking at, you know, are transit oriented versus transit adjacent. Um, far too many, um, you know, far too many um, housing developments. Uh, they might be built next to a train station, but uh, there's a mode of parking uh, between uh, the units uh, and the station. Um, there are plenty of places where right now you can see the commuter rail station, but if you wanted to walk there, you'd be taking your life uh, in your hands because there's no sidewalks um, there. So that's going to be a really key thing. And so I think backing up with sort of a little background, you know, on Boston and sort of how we how we got here is because you know we haven't been thinking about housing and transit policy, um, you know, in the same the same way. Some really stark uh, figures that I looked up are. You know, in in the last forty years, um, just the city of Boston alone. This isn't even counting the the, the broader um, region, but uh, Boston has gained about one hundred and fifteen thousand uh, people uh, since nineteen eighty, uh, but only added about numbers are a little bit hard to find, but around 40,000 40, housing units. Um, so that's you know pretty clear, pretty clear example. Uh, and then obviously that number it does include some children, but you know, as we know from the demographics across the country, that group is disproportionately uh, more adults. Uh, and so in that time period, not only have we not added probably the right amount of housing, 
uh, the MBTA has only added about nine miles um, of new of new track. Uh, so that you know, and you compare that to um, to a place like London, which I know is quite a bit bigger, but you know they've added about forty five to sixty miles of track, depending on how you categorize it, uh, or you know. Um, um, Madrid, a similar size city in Europe, is added about 142 miles. So, you know, there's there's you know been a lot of conversation about you know does you know does transit you know lead to gentrification and you know it's a it's a hard question that, to answer. But you know I think you know I think the, the the clear answer is that you know a lack of, of public transit. You know when you have um, you know both boomers and you have millennials and and now Gen Z, some elements of Gen Z are old enough to, to um, uh, you know, to be in the housing market. Whenever you have such a high, um, you know, such a high demand and such a high preference for walkable, transit-oriented neighborhoods, um, and in the U.S., we do such a um, bad job of building transit, you know, quickly uh, and, and and cheaply. That's when you're going to wind up with that that mismatch. So. Um, you know, I want to make sure we leave some some time for for questions. But you know, so some of the things that we're doing, transit matters. Um, you, you know, is where again we're really focusing on on this on our regional rail is is probably our biggest um, biggest initiative that we're working on, and we think it has a huge we think it has the potential to have a huge impact uh, on housing across the greater Boston region. And so, you know, going to this problem that I identified earlier about the fact that we're very slow to build new transit. One of the ways that we can um, fix that is by not relying on, you know, building, you know, underground, expensive, more time-consuming subways, but taking advantage of. It's actually the picture uh, behind me, taking advantage of of commuter rail um, and running commuter rail service like a subway. Um, and I think that, you know, a it's it's much quicker to do. You're taking advantage of infrastructure than it, that in a lot of our legacy cities is there, and even in some of our Sunbelt cities, they recently, um, not even recently, over the past 20 to 30 years have been building out um, commuter rail. So, you know, if we're able to uh, to run this service, you know, with faster, you know, electric trains um, and look at, you know, places where we can add in infill stations, uh, then, you know, you're opening up the housing market. You, you, uh, you're you opening up the housing market in, in, in cities or, you know, cities or suburban areas that um, either, you know, wouldn't be considering new housing or the housing would be a lot less dense and you're able to have that. And because you're, you know, working along a corridor uh, and you're not just doing, you know, a one-off station every 20 years, you know, I think that you're going to have that demand spread out um, a lot better. And so you're going to have less of that, of that sort of, you know, overwhelming demand, just swarming one neighborhood uh, and some of the impacts from there. So that's a big part of what we're doing. Again, working on uh, the multifamily zoning uh, initiative that I talked about earlier, uh, and then talking about mode shift, which I think really gets into uh, again this conversation about uh, electric vehicles. That electric vehicles are certainly going to be, you know, a um, a key part of our climate change adaptation strategy. But um, but you know, a car is still a car, and it still has some of those major drawbacks uh, when it comes to housing. Um, you know, we're talking about on the low end, ten thousand. Uh, all the way up to seventy-five, one hundred thousand uh, dollars for each structure parking space, uh, and that doesn't change when it's an electric vehicle. Um, the cost to operate it might get a little cheaper, um, you know, um, for for fuel, but um, you know, the current estimates are you know up to nine thousand dollars for um, you know nine thousand dollars a year to maintain a vehicle, uh, and you know, if we're still you know if if we haven't quite figured out the um, we haven't quite figured out the power solutions to this. There's no, there's no guarantee uh, that that cost to operate uh, an electric vehicle is going to be significantly cheaper. But again, you know, this isn't about, um, you know, this isn't about saying that those, that electric vehicles are not going to be a part of the future. But it's saying that, you know, we really have to look at, um, you really have to look at the impact of, of of a policy that leans far too heavily on that when we know that between the added cost of accommodating uh, vehicles and between the fights that you all know far too well uh, that happen in um, in community meetings uh, about um, parking spaces and about traffic. Um, you know, when we have a strategy that relies on that, we run into those problems. So, you know, um, before we get into questions, my ask uh, of, of the housing advocates is to uh, is to make sure that you're 
you're in touch with your transit, walking and cycling organization and figuring out um, you know, how you can make those connections uh, and how we can talk about um, making sure that your state or your region's climate change policy um, really talks about not only housing uh, and, and how denser, denser housing, um, you know, as, as speakers have pointed out, can have a huge impact uh, in, in emissions reduction, but also um, really lifting up the role of public transit, uh, walking and biking uh, to allow us to build denser and more affordable housing. So thank you. Thanks, Jared. We have about uh, 10 minutes or so for questions. Um, so I see at least, I think, first one in the back, uh, green shirt that you're looking behind yourself. Yes, you win. So let me just repeat the question because I think Jared will hear it through me. Um, and that's uh, thinking about how uh, environmental and climate groups, how we link them in and get them on board um, in this transportation and, and housing realm uh, as so our efforts are better coordinated. Does that say that's accurate? All right. Was that? Um, so the, I mentioned earlier just this interest of ours to kind of shift the thinking in the philanthropic community. I think the same thing kind of goes for um, your average envi otherwise environmentally inclined progressive city council member. Um, part of what we're trying to do is, is show the evidence that um, suggests that you can't, to, to get to a point basically where you're, it's very difficult to call yourself an environmentalist if you're still promoting and uh, supporting auto-centric development patterns and uh, transportation policies. I mean, I don't have any delusions or grandeur that we're gonna show them some slides though and it'll, it, you know, <laughs> it'll just switch their thinking like that, but I think um, you're starting to see, you know, especially I think the, the Yimby movement on the West Coast has been pretty successful at doing that recently, so. Um, again, I'm, I'm getting to be more optimistic about it, I guess. I'll just dive in. Yeah, I, I think to me it's a branding issue. Um, uh, free, freeways, freeway expansions are fossil fuel infrastructure. I mean, we can be against pipelines. Sorry, you're not. Is that working? Okay. Yeah. yeah, I was just going to say, thank you. Um, yeah, freeway expansions are fossil fuel infrastructure. Low density, automobile dependent suburban development is is fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, it's very easy to you know go go after a pipeline, highly visible, um, but but we haven't done a good job of, of branding the things that are the problem the problem. And then the solution is how we build more places where people can live more sustainably, have more uh, more common ordinary destinations within walking and biking distance, and have good transit access. <coughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think, you know, those are, those are all good points, and I, uh, I think. Gentlemen in the blue.
So the elephant in the room, suburbia, which we're, yes, uh, we can say chip away at things in cities and make those better, but you know, how, are, how do we apply this data that you all have presented in the suburban realm uh, where we're still uh, you know, emitted, it's increasing greenhouse gas emissions and increasing inequality and in transit access? Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting. I think uh, Toronto, um, you know, provides a really good lesson there. And that is that, you know, in most suburbs, there are still, you know, uh, often really wide, dangerous arterial roads. And so we can look at running really good bus service on there. But, you know, Toronto has um, a really efficient, highly utilized bus network, even out in the far suburban stretches of it that look identical to, you know, huge swaths of American suburbia. Uh, I also think e-bikes have the potential to be a game changer. That's the electric vehicle I'm really excited about. Uh, most, you know, over half of all trips uh, are under three miles. And so, you know, we can look at, you know, developing, um, you know, we can look at developing, you know, um, you know, bike paths or again, taking some of these wide arterial roads uh, and making sure that we have, you know, safe cycling facilities on there. So, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't underestimate the role, um, I wouldn't underestimate the ways that we can adapt, you know, suburbia. I mean, there's there's some great resources from, um, from some folks in this sort of the CNU universe on this suburban retrofit. And you see some of this, you know, happening already with strip malls, um, you know, being turned into, um, being you know, being turned into, you know, mixed use uh, developments that have, you know, housing and office space um, on top of it. So I think, you know, oftentimes we really focus on you know, the ultra commute, we focus on how to green, you know, how to green someone's work trip, um, you know, from 30 miles. But again, that's, that's a trip that they make, um, you know, five or you, know, you look at it 10 times uh, a week, but there are other trips that, that family makes uh, that are far, um, you know, that are far easier uh, to convert to some kind of green, um, some kind of green modes. I think those are a couple of the ways that we think about, um, you know, good, Good, definitely good transit policy, which I think then supports housing policy, even in suburban areas. Yeah, I think the good news is um, we don't have to retrofit all of suburbia. Um, and the bad news is you can't retrofit all of suburbia. And the fact is it is so decentralized. So your opportunities to, to, to the extent you do retrofit it, will be in selected locations where you have density in transit. Uh, so. That's the one solution. The other solution is to build more housing in the places where we already have the good transit access. Um, but but very low, you're not gonna redo all the low density into higher density. You don't need to uh, because it's occupying far more land than you need, uh, as the questioner said, to accommodate all those people. I don't really have much to add. I think they both covered it well, but I mean, I think one of the things that we were, I was personally really excited to see your slides on the, the corner stores and is something we've been thinking about is how do you like rebalance kind of commercial rebalancing and putting more services like grocery stores in the suburban context that isn't just like a you know, strip shopping center. We probably have time for one more question in the back, a purple sweater. So Jared, this question was for you about how you got in Massachusetts multifamily by right um, around transits. Um, and particularly, you know, where, where did you encounter challenges? Um, and maybe even was it particularly specifically around height? Yeah, no, so the, the interesting thing was, you know, there weren't as many challenges around this particular a piece of legislation as much as it was just sort of the, 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 you know, the overall battle, you know, over a number of years to get this, um, you know, to get this to be sort of included in this, 
this large you know suite of uh, you know of initiatives. Um, so really, the, the battle is ahead, right? You know, this we we actually weren't expecting uh, this to pass. We were almost certain it was going to get uh, vetoed. But I think you know I think what had happened in Massachusetts is our our uh, our governor um, you know has long you know tried to to work on housing. Uh, and he had originally sort of taken this stance of trying to incentivize communities to build more housing. And, you know, naturally, the communities that already built a lot of housing did it. And the communities, the wealthier um, NIMBY communities that didn't want to build housing didn't because they, they have so much money. And these, um, the, the, you know, these little awards weren't, um, weren't useful. And so I think, you know, that led him to be, you know, frustrated and say, you know what, you know, rep, you know, reps and centers keep putting this into the, into the bill, let's pass it. Um, but yeah, like I said, the the, the challenges are, are what we see lying ahead. And so we have already heard um, some communities saying, even though this this new one, um, this new program, um, you know, it's it's not only it's not this time it's not sort of incentive based. This time you will actually lose some amounts of funding. But you have cities and towns saying, oh, you know, we we can probably you know afford to to lose it. Or another one, you know, you know, it's like. You know the bingo sheet. It's 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 schools. You know it is um, infrastructure. You know even though they would be losing out on dollars that would help them, you know, build the sewer infrastructure. So, you know, I think our um, you know our strategy is really going to be to you know to tell the the positive message on the economic development. Um, you know that these communities uh, are foregoing. Um, you know, on one hand, you've seen communities talk about how they don't want it, but then also acknowledge that the town is getting older and older uh, and they're worrying about the future of their town and so i think you know that's what we're trying to do and we're also trying to to um you know our, our hope is that the momentum carries on and so you know our hope is that this year we can look at how we can you know both strengthen the 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 enforcement mechanisms of it but also how to be more generous with towns um you know that that want to the one that want to do this be more generous in a real meaningful way uh, and help to alleviate some of those concerns uh, about sewer infrastructure, um, about other things, and again, that's where the regional rail, you know, comes into play uh, too. Because we can say, you know, the, the idea is that you will have significantly more capacity, um, you know, uh, on this commuter rail line if we're running trains, you know, in some cases up to four or five times more frequently. Um, so that, I think that's really, you know, that's where it is. So it, it so you know, hopefully, um, you know, at next year's Yimby Town, um, you know, I can have some 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 feedback on how this year has gone um so yeah thanks yeah we definitely love uh success stories absolutely uh so let's take a moment to thank our panelists for uh their time today it's great to have them here and i hope to see everyone else uh throughout the rest of the uh, conference enjoy